The new SP3, the Canadian provider Bryston, offers a surround preamplifier with a claim to belong to one of the home cinema systems with the best sound worldwide. For this purpose, Bryson equips the SP3 with all that is needed for a good sound, for example with HDMI 1.4, with 8 inputs and 2 outputs, several actual high-definition sound decoders are on board as well. But based on the opinion of the Canadian developers, everything got erased that isn't needed for the best possible sound reproduction. Like that there is no automatic room measurement, no Wi-Fi, no internet radio, and the whole video processing is reduced on looping through the HDMI signals. There is even no on-screen display. But at the same time, the developers dedicated the focus much more on the sound quality for the technical features regarding the power supply layout, separation of components, channel separation, signal-to-noise ratio and so on. Although the SP3 is focused on a technical diet, the client needs to have a packed bank account because entering the world of the SP3 costs 10,500 euros or 12,860 dollars and is pretty expensive like that. How much sound and technical equipping you get for the money, I'm gonna tell you in the next few minutes. In comparison to the most AV receivers, visually the Bryson SP3 acts unspectacular at the first sight. Like other providers for surround preamps, Bryson puts a high worth on a timeless elegance and excellent workmanship quality in detail. This we can see on the aluminium front panel, which is made pretty massive, the profile is worked in very well and it has a very worthy and precious plating. The volume control goes absolutely precise and easy and it makes fun to regulate with the hands. After a look at the casing cover, it's easy to see that it's a massive work as well, with screws that are installed flush in the casing cover and are connected to the basic unit like that. Even after a look at the backside, you can see at the ports that you have arrived in the high-end league. The lucky clients who could order this SP3 can choose between a black and a silver front panel and can choose between a green LCD screen like here or a blue edition. The SP3 has a very exclusive construction philosophy. The provider puts the focus on giving the maximum discrete soundtrack stored on a Blu-ray out to the speakers in the highest possible sound quality. That means that the SP3 has a 7.1 channel layout without any additional added speakers, all actual high-definition sound formats are integrated, inclusively Dolby True High Definition, DTS High Definition Master Audio, even all the several HDMI resolutions are supported, inclusively 3D, so here we're talking about HDMI 1.4 compatibility. Things like streaming features features, a phono stage, a tuner and so on are completely deleted, the aim is to limit on the minimum, because according to the Bryson developer's opinion, there's no need to have automatic room measurement, 
on-screen menus, norm converter, video equalizer, scaler, deinterlizer, all that got deleted. But the SP3 is built modularly to be able to keep up with the techniques and the future generations in this way of construction. Then the user is able to change several parts. The consistent layout of this advice you can see after look at the inner life. Here we can see that it has two floors. On the upper floor we can find a whole power supply together with the HDMI section. On the floor beneath we can find the analog and digital audio processing. Generally Bryson put very much attention on short and optimized signal paths, what is recognizable very well on the signal to noise ratio of 105 decibel. As you easily can see, the SP3 doesn't only differ externally and functionally, but also regarding the inner life to normal AV receivers and surround preamps. Let's go quickly into detail again. Here on the upper floor, as already mentioned, we can find a power supply. The primary voltage first gets generated by that worthy toroid transformer, exclusively produced for the SP3, and gets supported by these four capacitors with a capacity of 27,000 microfarad. Interesting is that the rest heat that is caused by the power supply gets absorbed by these four little power transistors, directly to the floor panel. This one is screwed together with the rest very strongly so that this advice is specially constructed to absorb the heat through the housing. Like that, the SP3 comes along without any fans that may cause a bothering airflow. The SP3 has three power supplies that provide a digital board, the front panel and analog circuit. The analog circuit even includes a discrete analog A-class connection in the analog output driver section, where the voltage gets increased to make sure that the components work well. Like that, Bryson is trying to achieve a maximum possible separation of the components from each other regarding problems like crosstalk or interference. Like already mentioned, here we also have the HDMI section. In this case, Bryson uses a chip by analog devices, model AD. V3002, and this is a pure HDMI DVI switch where only video goes through and audio gets tapped and gets forwarded to the analog and digital audio processing. Moreover, Bryson told me that this way jitter can be minimized. Now we're one floor beneath where we can see the base for digital audio processing. This works on the basic of a DA710 chip by Texas Instruments, which works with 300 MHz and 32 bits. It's the most powerful from the second generation of the Aureus Audio DSP family and offers high-speed audio decoding and post-processing. It supports two zones. So far the SP3 has another additional zone that only supports stereo and doesn't have a video output. Of course, the more powerful chips and processors, even by Texas Instruments, but these ones are especially made for networking and video features, what we don't need here. Then we can see the other side of the audio motherboard, where we can find all analog output stages that are symmetrical to the XLR interfaces that are additional to the chinch outputs. Moreover, pretty worthy Delta Sigma DA converters work here with 24 bits and 192 kilohertz. After a look at the backside, we can see the often mentioned HDMI input, overall 8 of them, as well as two outputs. Then we have several analog chinch and stereo in and output interfaces. Then we have four digital coaxial and two optical ports. Important about the preamp is that we have XLR inputs and outputs. Other additional functions are that it has a USB B socket for notebooks, network socket, but this one is not for streaming. Only only made for controlling and service issues, but even without an iPhone control. And an RS-232 interface for the integration and control systems. Who's interested can have access to a small web server on the SP3, take a look at the actual configuration and status, make some changings. Here we can find a link to the user's manual as well and general troubleshooting. It's a very practical thing. Through this, new firmwares can be updated. Despite the purism, there is a lot to explain about the handling and setup options. First, it has to be mentioned that everything is happening on this screen, 
We have no on-screen menu, settings have to be checked and watched here. The structure on the front panel is like that. Here we have a selection of the sources, here are the additional zones, or better, the main zone, and then here zone 2, and then at the sources it's USB 7.1 amulet inputs. At the numbered buttons from 1 to 8, we have to know that they are triple functional. Right now I've chosen input 1, above you can see a green LED for HDMI 1, where my Blu-ray player is connected to, then here I can see the fitting info. Now here I can push the button digital, and then the SP3 activates the available digital input for source 1, this I can influence by myself and set it. In contrast to the analog input, because this one is fixed and I can activate it with pushing the button digital, so that neither digital nor HDMI is selected. Like this it switches over to analog, which is assigned to source one. Two-channel bypass means that the analog input gets activated, several unnecessary features get turned off, bass management is circumvented. But the two-channel bypass can't be used on digital sources when I would like to listen to stereo with circumventing eventual DSP features, then first I would have to choose a digital source, and then we have to wait a little bit because the SP3 needs some time for that to detect. It's not that fast, but now it's here. And now, when I push the button stereo, it's done. And what has to be known is that as soon as I push the button two channel bypass, then the HDMI option is off. When you know that, it's pretty easy to use. Now we go to the digital part because I'd like to show you something on the LCD screen. The first line of the four-line screen informs you about source and source mode. Then we have input signal, output signal, as well as the actual volume. When I'd like to enter the menu or change settings, I have four buttons. With the surround mode buttons, and optionally with the volume control, I can change the particular values. When I push the left button, I get additional infos, in this case information about the actual firmware. I'm using 2012.05e. When I push the right button I get to the menu, where we have the global values under system setup on one hand, and one below we have the source relevant settings. Under that point we have the speaker's distance, those can be set in 10 cm steps, in practice this is totally enough. On the digital sources I can do an assignment of the digital inputs, for example CD, optical input number 3, and so on. Even pretty easy. By the way, this is now the only possibility to assign the sources, unfortunately I can't rename the sources. On the point miscellaneous, we have a few environment variables, for example the brightness of the screen, headphone output, which is down at the right corner, or switch on volume. And this is very interesting. Auxiliary connections on the back side I can either use for center subwoofer, so an additional center speaker output, an additional subwoofer output, so that here I have two outputs, or stereo left and right, or it is very practical for BM to be able to provide two power amps with signals. That has an effect on the XLR and chinch outputs of this preamp. The screen timeout is very interesting as well, because of course it defines when a screen switches off. What many people don't pay attention on is that if you're scrolling through this, we also have the possibility to dim the LEDs, what I definitely recommend, because the whole sound of this advice is better if the front screen is off. So you should take a look at that as well. Then we still have the unit for switching off the speakers, trigger delay and information about the network interface. Now you can see some things are missing, those we can find under source setup, especially bass management and channel level. In this point I can really set each source independently. Under speaker size I can set the size of the speakers, if there is a speaker in general or not. Now I can set the center speaker on none, so it's deselected. 
Then we have speaker level, not that surprising, but it's good that it's depending on the source, at the moment still with 0.5 decibel steps, and it's okay, I already contacted the provider if it's possible to make it more sensible, they said it's possible and makes sense, I'm pretty curious if this will be put in practice in the next firmwares. The crossover frequency, I can start with 40 Hz up to, I think, 140, no, it goes higher, up to 200 Hz, separated from center, surround and the surround back speakers. The subwoofer can be switched on and off, bypass mode can be activated and the extra bass mode can be switched on, which uses simultaneously the frequencies of the front channel. Then I can set the trigger configuration especially for the fitting input. The following menu point is very interesting. If I have a 5.1 stream, a DTS high definition 5.1 stream with the actual 7.1 configuration, then I have to choose whether it should adapt or not. Because while the video is playing, even with the DSP buttons, it's not possible to switch and to activate the back speakers. That means that under ES Apply, neither you have to set digital EX Dolby, it sets the Prologic 2X variations movie, music and automatic, automatic detects on his own if it's music or movie, nor I have to push the force button, then DTS ES is activated, so that I have a mono signal on the back speakers, and in the automatic mode, the native stream gets played, 5.1 stays 5.1 and doesn't get adapted. With Dolby it's the same again. When I enter its menu, I can define the adaption of the variables for two-channel material, like we know that, center and music dimension, and under EX apply, it's the same again, but then for Dolby. When pushing the button other, we can find a very useful function, namely PCMZR, that deals with the signal recognition, and when this is set on disabled, then it comes very fast, but at the same time can produce some failures, for example like with my Oppo BDP93, which detected the Dolby Digital Stream as a PCM after skipping the chapter and send the background noise to the speakers. If you have this problem in a source, you only have to set on another version through the disable button. There's a lot of options. I haven't tried everything yet, but actually the automatic mode is the best to be able to work without any kind of problems. So much regarding the device, now quickly something about the DSP features. At the moment it detected a two-channel PCM signal, and if I push the surround mode buttons, you can see that here we can choose between Prologic's 2X music, logically the music version, that whole thing by DTS Neo 6. Stereo 7 is the stereo signal that got split on the whole surround environment, then we have party, this is the mono signal that gets filtered out, an identical signal to all the speakers, club 5.0, then it continues with pass-through, that signalizes an unchanged loop-through up into multi-channel, then we're on ProLogic again, ProLogic 2 natural, so here we have several DSP features, even if it's not that unbelievably extensive like with other preamps. Now let's have a look at the remote control. Bryson ran riot here. It's made of full aluminium, it's ground, pretty heavy, fit the hand well, even if we can't talk about a comfortable use regarding all its small buttons and the remote control only controls the SP3 and no additional devices. It has an automatic backlight and the SP3 can be controlled very easily and reliably with it, even if it's a bit strange to control a device like that with such a big remote control. But it makes fun, I like to use it and it impresses me much more than any other cheap remote controls that you get with other devices. Talk is cheap. I have to say that the SP3 is absolutely marvelous. The precision and resolution that you get with that device just kicked me off my feet. I'm 100% enthusiastic from A to Z and convinced. It reminds me back at the time when I heard the AudioNet Map V2 with an EPS module for the first time. It's very neutral, there's absolutely no sound emphasizing, so open, so fresh, effortless and free that it's a delight to re-experience the Blu-ray collection.
I've really seen Star Wars many, many times now, but these details, these mechatronical sounds of C-3PO, or the last pressure and explosions, or the difference of the several sounds, even the speaking, that device makes all these things with a complexity, a transparency and sovereignty that to me it's just amazing to be able to experience a device like that. I was really surprised that it's still possible to do it better than you already know it. At complex happenings, while actually scenes, the SP-3 truly flourishes. For example, in Terminator 3, the SP-3 manages it excellently to highlight several effects and to offer an amazing sound transparency, and interestingly, even in such heavy sequences, it doesn't cause a problem listening loud because of its sovereignty and sensibility. No device plays as sovereign in detail as the SP-3. And even when you're watching more smooth movies, some Hollywood comedy like this, for example, even here you can recognize the details in speeches, the interaction between the score and some noise in the background, and many, many things that gives you a new experience of watching Blu-ray. There's an effect that I've been through several times, even with other devices. In many Blu-ray reviews, they say that the sound of comedies is front-heavy and that there's nothing in the back. Well, I don't know. The people should buy an SP3 and they'll be surprised how many additional details they can discover in the back that really can be recognized and create a deeper sound picture. So generally speaking, and the music comes out of the box is very clear. It makes a lot of fun to enjoy movies with the SP3, but even concerts produce magic. When I'm playing Michael Jackson, for example, the synthy effects come out very airy, smooth and honest. The voice is very clear and the kick basses are carried by perfect playtime and high precision and separation. When we're talking about bass, and we said it a bit more brutal, and are playing the movie 2012, for example, especially on the example of this XP3 subwoofer, it's, how to say, it's shocking how real the combination of pressure, volume and and precision acts in a real environment, so it's really heavy, but impressing. When I compare it to other components right now, I have the Denon A1 preamp in front of me, it's surely not a bad device, it's a dream, especially with the 3D update, it liquidates very well. Overall, it plays a bit slower, softer, has a bit more individual sound, but doesn't mean it's bad, depends on what I use it for. But if I have horn speakers, I wouldn't like to use them with a detailed and analytically oriented SP3. In this case, a preamp like the Denon A1 might be more sovereign. But otherwise, if I check the market, there's actually no alternative with a sound level like the SP3 has it. For example, devices like the Rotel RSP1572 or Arcam AV. 888. These are surely not bad ones, but they're definitely playing one or two leagues below the SP3 regarding sound details, dynamics and toneless solution, and they even can't touch the Denon A1. So, for perfectionists, there's no alternative to the SP3 at the moment. Even in stereo use, the preamp is so good that it's just an eyelash behind this 10,000 euro pure stereo preamp AudioNet Pre G2. And this only because of the last little emotion that the AudioNet is ahead, what is technically not explainable. But from the technical view, the SP3 is as sharp, precise, complex, stage lighting as the AudioNet. So 99% of all stereo preamps and power amps that I have seen can't touch the SP3, and that's a word. Not to mention some home cinema preamps. Like we say, only one fly doesn't cost summertime. Of course, even the SP3 needs the fitting components, despite its quality, to be able to max out the sound quality potential of this preamp. This starts with the source device. Here I can recommend to compare, to listen to high quality things, not to buy some cheap player like Digital is Digital, because that is totally wrong regarding the sound spectrum what the SP3 can offer. You can hear the difference. Even you should pay attention on the power cable and the polarity of the power cable. Regarding hi-fi preamps, I only have these ones from AudioNet. They work very well, very precise, with a very stable level and high dynamic. Also, I have two preamps from Bryston. They were okay as well, can harmonize with the SP3. 
but are made with less focus on precision like the audio nets, but with much more power. There you really have, there you really have to see what efficiency, speakers and levels you prefer. Regarding the speakers, I already mentioned that I put less weight on front heavy ones because sometimes those might sound too aggressive because the speakers are bundling more and distort in higher frequencies. And this gets demonstrated by the preamp with no mercy, while a softer preamp like the Denon A1 works more neat. So, always, as high resoluting, sovereign and cultivated as possible. I don't use those isophonic speakers with diamond and ceramic equipping for nothing. They fit absolute perfectly. But even this Aurum Titan 8 worked excellent and unfortunately belongs to the small number of speakers that have a ribbon tweeter and which don't have the tendency to act aggressive. So they make fun. Also, we tried the SP3 with that Electra BE2 by Focal with a beryllium tweeter and those are fantastic as well and harmonize with the Bryce SP3 very well too. My only critics about the SP3 is that if you connect a 2D and 3D beamer at the same time, a 3D play is not possible because both edits of both devices get read out and the specified formats of both devices are supported. In this case, Bryson is planning to update because no one else ever wanted to mix 2D and 3D. I'd always need to disconnect the second screen to be able to watch 3D, but aside from that, all video processing features were working, the loop through, the picture quality, the reliability of a computer, game consoles with different resolutions, PAL, NTSC, high definition, 3D, all worked well. In practice, we recognize that it runs very reliably, System crashes are pretty rare, but when we're testing with several different players, it's something else, like the normal use at home. What bothered me in controlling this device is the small letters on the screen. In my case, I'm sitting three meters away from it, and I can't see which surround mode is activated. So it'll be nice if in case of a change the surround mode could be shown bigger on the screen, because like that it's gonna be an eye test, where I have to stand up often to see. Did I activate Prologic 2 music or movie, because we don't have an on-screen display here. So this needs a progress. The handling is okay so far, you just have to find your way, and then it's okay. The heat dissipation is good. It's hand warm, not really hot. I didn't check it, but I think it's about 40 to 45 degrees, so it's acceptable. We have to know that there's no cooling sound of a fan, so I can just praise this device regarding all its sound attitudes and the practical rating. The Bryson SP3 is definitely a characteristic type with angularity and flatness. Users who'd like to have an 11.1 channel layout, an iPhone control or looking for Wi-Fi streaming features won't be happy with this preamp and should watch out for something else. Like Bryson claims, Reduce on the max, they really did everything to focus on the sound and to create a multi-channel audio preamp for sophisticated movie fans. And the Canadians did that absolutely. Everything that is needed is included, like HDMI 1.4, 7.1 channel layout, all actual high definition formats, and we don't need to talk about the sound, I was talking enough about that. It's amazing and fantastic what it produces. But the pure view at the price is not really unspectacular. And I really don't want to tell you that the sound compensates it because every user has to know his own needs and the potential of his speakers. My opinion is that it's a privilege to enjoy movies and partly to re-experience them. This is it. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Das war's von mir. Vielen Dank für Ihr Interesse und bis zum nächsten Mal. Tschüss.